Matthew 25, 31. This is still in that section of Scripture where we're in the last week. Jesus and the disciples had visited the temple and coming out, the disciples said, Lord, look what a beautiful building this is. And Jesus said, I'm telling you the truth. Uh, this thing, there won't be a stone left on another. It's going to be completely destroyed. And they said, well, when's this going to happen? Can you tell us about the end and the signs of your coming? So all of 24 and 25 are uh, centered on that. So it, just look at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. So the first word is when, and that's the question they're asking. When, when are all these things going to happen? And we don't get an answer, you know, a day, week, month, year, but we do have a better idea that this one is talking about uh, the end of time rather than the destruction of Jerusalem. Go all the way to the end, verse 46. In verse 46, he says, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And we'll mention that again when, when we get there. But this is not God breaks into history and then history keeps going. This is the end of history as we know it. So the, the good are, go into uh, eternal life. The evil go into eternal punishment. It's the same word. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a little bit. But probably not talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Probably talking about the end of time, the final judgment. All right, verse 32. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Right? So when we say the word sheep, what comes to mind? Anything in particular scripturally? Children Jesus, right? Do what? Children of God. Children of God. Right. So it, it's a, a positive thought. Uh, Jesus, the Lamb of God. Uh, I think about Passover. Jesus was killed as the Passover lamb. Uh, all over town, they were killing and roasting Passover lambs to remember God's grace and the fact that he brought them up out of Egypt with a powerful hand. So sheep tend to give us a, a positive thought. What about goats? the opposite, but I like goats. <laughs> you like goats? Uh, goats are more uh, connected to the Day of Atonement, which was a day of sorrow. You had a, a bull that was killed and a goat that was killed. And then a third animal, another goat, that was sent out into the desert, right? We call it the scapegoat. So it was one that carried the sins of the people out into the desert. So they were separated from their sins. So it's kind of a positive thing, but the animal itself carries kind of a negative connotation. Um, not necessarily because goats are bad and sheep are good, but just the way people visualize them and the roles that they played in um, Jewish history and Jewish religion. Uh, it says that he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left, and if you didn't already have an idea of good and bad based on sheep and goats, then you would immediately understand that the sheep are the good ones and the goats are the bad ones by this reference. Now in our culture, not so much anymore, but in the Jewish culture, the right hand was a good hand and the left hand was a bad hand. You would never offer your left hand to somebody, it was a great insult. Uh, but to offer your right hand was good. To say that someone would sit on Jesus' right hand when he comes in his kingdom, it's a good thing. Right? But left-handed was a bad thing. Uh, I always bring up the Last Supper where they're all reclining around the table. This would be Oriental style. They would have been leaning on their left hand and eating with their right hand because it was taboo to eat with your left hand. So they're all eating right-handed, uh, John, the son of Zebedee, is laying next to Jesus. And Peter says, ask him who he's talking about that's going to betray him. And so John leans back against Jesus and asks him, who is, who is it that's going to betray you? So 
all of that's because the left hand is bad and the right hand is good. So when he says he puts the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand, all of the listeners would have immediately said, oh, well, the sheep are the good guys and the goats are the bad guys. All right. Uh, verse 34, the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father and take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. So enter into the kingdom that's been prepared for you since the creation of the world. Uh, this is the opposite of what we'll see here in a little bit, but this is something that's prepared for the righteous ones even before the world is created. So all the way back before in the beginning God, and he already has in mind this place for the righteous to dwell. Um, Ephesians 1, we were chosen in Christ Jesus before the world was created. So it's always been in the mind of God to have something special a place specially prepared for the righteous ones. Uh, now we'll compare that in a little bit to the place where the unrighteous end up. But I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. If you were making a, a list of the criteria for judgment, right? this is what makes you a sheep. This is what makes you blessed. This is what makes you a right-hand person. Uh, what would be on your list? See, as, as a lifetime uh, Church of Christ minister's son and Church of Christ minister, my list might include these things, but I would be more prone to have a list of things that we do corporately, right? Doing worship correctly, uh, baptism questions, um, right understanding about the end of the world. You know, are you a premillennialist or are you a postmillennialist? Are you an amillennialist? All those questions would pop into my mind. Jesus says, let's talk about the simple stuff. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was sick, and you visited me. You took care of me. I was in prison, and you showed up. So all of those things are important to him as far as eternal salvation or condemnation is concerned. And so I started thinking, well, what things when I'm thinking about scripture, do I think about as far as salvation issues are concerned, right? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned, right? That would be my go-to. That's where I run. Um, whoever confesses me before man, him will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. With the heart of man believes, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Those are the, the things that come to my mind. But on the last week of his life, he's a couple of days from the cross, he says, here's the criteria for this great judgment. Get everybody from everywhere, and I want to know, I was hungry, did you give me something to eat? I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? I was a stranger, you invited me in. And, and I did a little bit of reading on that one. In their culture, that was a huge deal because they didn't have holiday inns. Right? When we think about, okay, I'm going to travel to another city, um, we think in terms of, well, let's make our accommodations. And so we call ahead and we get a B&B &B or we get a hotel or we, we carry our uh, trailer with us or whatever, We're, so we'll have a place to stay. In the Middle East or in the Near East in those days, there was very little of that available. So when you got to town, somebody would have to either take care of you or you slept in the city square. Think back to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Lots in Sodom, and here come these guys, and he's like, you need to come stay at my house. Uh, there's another story very similar to it about uh, a priest who is traveling, and he has his concubine with him, and they, they say, you need to get off the city square. You need to come stay at our house. So it was a mark of just being a good human being if you took care of people. So I, you know, I was in need of hospitality, and you took care of me. Clothes, needed clothes, you clothed me, I was sick, you looked after me, I was in prison, you came to visit me. Very 
common needs filled are the things that Jesus uses for this judgment. Uh, verse 37, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothes you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. And again, this is another one of those new NIV passages where it just says for these brothers. But they say, well, it, it has to mean brothers and sisters, and it does. But it's playing a little fast, loose with the Greek right there. Uh, but it's a recurring theme in Jesus' teachings all through his ministry, all the way back to the Sermon on the Mount. The way you treat people is the way God treats you. If somebody sins against you and you won't forgive them, why would you assume that God's going to forgive you? So here you are, you see somebody in need, you take care of them, so God will take care of you. You'll receive something good in response to the good that you did. Uh, and again, it just feels like I need to throw a disclaimer out there that, you know, please don't expect to be saved just because you're nice to people. Right? It, it just it just feels like you have to say that. It's, it's necessary. But in this passage, on this day, talking to these people, Jesus does not bring up any other subjects. He doesn't say, oh, and along with that, make sure you keep the law. And along with that, you know, check in with my apostles when I'm gone because you're going to need Christian baptism. He just says, if you take care of people, God will take care of you. And they say, well, when did we do that? And he says, well, you didn't see me, but you took care of people in my name. Right? Uh, what's the other passage? Uh, you give a cup of water to someone in my name, you won't lose your blessing. And so it was something that was on Jesus' mind. Taking care of people was a big thing. Then he turns to those on his left. Good guys or bad guys? Bad guys, we know already. Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Right? Who was the kingdom prepared for? The good, the good people, the righteous people, right? This was prepared for you from the found, from before the foundation of the world. This one is prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, the word devil here uh, is the diabolu, and that means the liar. So this has been prepared for the liar and his ambassadors, those that work for him. There's a couple of possible interpretations. One is angels that just work on behalf of the devil, right? so liars, helpers. Or uh, some take it to mean the angels that went with him. So when he left the heavenlies, when he rebelled against God, some went with him. Uh, there's a passage in Revelation that talks about the dragon sweeping a third of the stars from the heavens. And some people take that to mean that a third of the angels followed Satan. So we don't know exactly what happened. Um, but he had those who served him. I assume that he still does. But there is a fire prepared for them. When you read the toward the end of Revelation, Satan is taken and thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. So you have him finally delivered to the place that was prepared for him. But this wasn't prepared for people. Right? This was prepared for the devil and his angels, but those who are influenced by him end up having the same fate. Uh, verse 42, I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will say, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Again, if you don't take care of people, why do you assume that God will take care of you? But there's this plea of ignorance from both the sheep and the goats, from the good guys and the bad guys. Well, we had no idea. So it's not that the good guys were trying to please God by doing this. They were just taking care of people. 
And then God says, well, because you were just taking care of people, I want to reward you. And the bad guys weren't trying to oppose God or they weren't trying to, to do something anti-kingdom. They were just selfish. They didn't want to help other people. They didn't. And God says, well, I'm going to punish you for not being the kind of people that would help others. So it's, it's a fairly simple parable as far as the application is concerned, but it's so far-reaching. We've got so many other things we want to add into the text and say, yeah, but Jesus, what about? You know, what about this law and that law and this teaching and that teaching? Um, it's just not in his purview in this parable. That's not what he's trying to talk about. And it doesn't undo any of the other things that we find important in Scripture. It's just something that's an overriding theme in Jesus' ministry that we need to take care of people uh, and that in doing so, we can honor God. Uh, I want to get the quote right. Uh, chapter, Matthew chapter uh, 16, 5, uh, 14. You're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I mean, that's the marching orders. Do, do good for the sake of God. And evidently the sheep didn't know they were doing that, but it, it was a good reflection on God. Think about it for a minute. If, if you live up on a hill, let's say we build this beautiful house on top of one of these buttes and, and you can see the house for forever. And you, light, you turn on your living room light. Do you do that so that the people down at the bottom of the hill can see the light? No, no you do that because it's dark in your living room. No, so, so when we do that, when we, when we light the light, we're not necessarily thinking in terms of other people seeing it. We're not doing it necessarily thinking in terms of, oh, won't God like it if I do this? We're just doing it because it needs to be done. And God sees and then returns the good to us. Uh, verse 46 is an important verse, and I want us to just spend a moment, not much more than that. Uh, they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Um, there is a teaching that's going around, I don't know how long it's been, or maybe for a long, long time, that hell is not a place of eternal punishment, but a place of final destruction. And the argument goes something like this. When you read a passage and it says that... Uh, they're thrown out into Gehenna uh, where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out. That what it means is, right, hell's always there. It's eternal. But when you get thrown in, you just cease to exist. It just burns you up and that's how God disposes of souls. A uh, couple of problems with that. Number one, are we assuming that Satan and his angels will just be consumed by the fire and be gone? I don't think so. Um, this passage uses the same word to describe eternal life and eternal punishment. The Greek word is ionios. It means the same thing. If, if we want eternal life, we have to accept eternal condemnation as the alternative. It's, it's either both are eternal or one is eternal and one is, you know, very temporary and then you're gone. So I'm not a Greek scholar, but I have a friend who does a lot more Greek study than I do. And he recently covered this uh, subject. So I called him today. It was, it was great to get to talk to him. He's a great guy. And, and uh, he's one of these guys that while he's talking to you, your head is just swimming and he's talking about all the books that he read last week, and you know, you know, I just, I just try to keep up and nod my head on the phone. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Uh, but anyway, uh, the fact that that he saw things similarly to the way I saw things helped me with that. And he brought up a couple of other passages that um, that talk about the eternal nature of hell, and it's not what we want to hear, right? It's not. 
it's not the, the outcome that we want for anybody. Uh, one of the reasons that people are, are going that direction, obviously, is that sympathy button. We, we, when we see the possibility that somebody might be in a situation like that for eternity, if we don't feel sorry for them, something's broken. Right? We may not be able to fix it, but we need to understand the gravity of it. Um, the same thing is true of the Catholic Church, at least in the middle centuries. I think they're trying to kind of backpedal away from it now. But purgatory, purgatory comes from the same word that we use to, to cleanse something, to purge something. Right? And the idea was that if you weren't really bad enough for hell, but you weren't really good enough for heaven, you go to purgatory. And you would stay in purgatory for less than eternity. You know, an indis indis undisclosed amount of time. And when you had had your sins purged, burned off, whatever, then you would be released from captivity and purgatory and sent to heaven. So you'd finally get there. One of the reasons that they did that is because nobody wants anybody to go to hell. The other reason that they did that is it was very, very lucrative. If, if you sent somebody to hell, you couldn't do anything about it. But if the church said, oh, that guy's in purgatory, you could start making payments. You could do good deeds to help buy people out of purgatory or to buy yourself out. Or you could actually pay money to get your, your friends out of purgatory. So when Martin Luther was on the planet, there was a guy named Johann Tetzel. And Johann Tetzel worked for the uh, Catholic Church, and his job was to raise money to build St. Peter's Basilica. And the way he raised money was to preach this sermon that rhymes in English, I don't know what it is in German, but uh, as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And he would go around all over Europe preaching this sermon and people would you know they were given out of their uh, out of their poverty because you know I'm I'm pretty sure that my mom was not quite good enough to get to heaven because nobody really is right you've probably got somebody in purgatory that you need to help out because none of us are quite good enough what if they died and they didn't get the last rites what if they didn't make it to the priest to to give their confessional that week before they fell off the horse probably in purgatory we better have we better play it safe and get a little money on their behalf. Um, Martin Luther went to the Vatican to climb up the steps on his knees to pray Hail Marys and, and uh, Our Fathers to, to try to, to find that level of penance so that maybe he could understand the whole purgatory thing. And he came back with, I feel nothing. <laughs> there's nothing. There's no difference in, in where I was before and where I am now. Anyway, people forever have hated the idea of an eternal, ongoing, unending hell. Uh, and like I said, if you don't hate that idea, there's something wrong with you. It's terrible. Uh, but it's just because God has given us a way to not be in hell, sacrificed his own son so that we didn't have to. And here Jesus says, think about how you treat other people when you're thinking about whether you want to go to a place prepared for you or a place prepared for the devil and his angels. How you treat other people has something to say about that. So it's, it's huge, uh, and it's, it's a tremendous parable on which to end our study of parables. Any questions or thoughts about any of that?